Yo, 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 what's up, guys? It's your chef, Rob Pegson. They call me Professor Chef. And for two of you wonderful human beings out there, they call me Daddy. Boys, I love you. Uh, today's, today is Saturday, Jan 14. Happy birthday, Father, my dad. Happy birthday. And um, I made this entrepreneurship video, video for all of you. Uh, Saturday is my entrepreneurship day. Now, it's entrepreneurship day since 2016. Because since 2016, I uh, started offering these classes on Saturdays called Prime. And it's been a nice habit that we talk about entrepreneurship uh, for beginners. And not just for beginners, even for some people who have experience, but probably no education like me. So I want to share this video. This video is dedicated to all of you guys out there who are starting out. Uh, all of you guys who pro and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, who have probably hit a roadblock that you have to overcome somehow. And this video is titled Entrepreneurship for Beginners Part 1. It's part one in a series because I'm just going to keep going and going on this topic. It will eventually be its own playlist. Uh, and the title of this particular video, I wanted to encapsulate my entire entrepreneurial experience as what I learned from these schools. So the schools in question are uh, the California Culinary Academy, uh, 1999. That's the year of the Y2K. We thought the world was going to end because it was ones and zeros and no one could. We didn't know how computers would calculate the year 2000 as a zero again, would it? Uh, so the world did not end, thankfully. After the California Culinary Academy, there was CCA in Manila. And then I went to the Asian Institute of Management in Makati in Metro Manila. Uh, later on, my thesis was go a school called Aka. Shout out to all my Akans everywhere. Still love you. Miss those days. Those were awesome days. The Academy for International Culinary Arts, which was my thesis in the Asian Institute of Management. And after Aka, we uh, had this school, school called Global Academy. Shout out to, to all my global global globalistas, globalians everywhere, all around the world. Uh, chances are, if you eat food in a restaurant, one of my students has cooked for you, no matter where you are in the world. So I can say that. I'm very proud of that. I have a global alumni community, personally, me, of 15,000 strong. So what's up, ladies and gentlemen? Chef Rob, sending you some love wherever you are. And I kid you not. You may be eating in a cruise ship, in a hotel, in a Michelin-starred restaurant, or a hole in the wall. Chances are you, if you travel... Uh, and you go around the world, be it from the Middle East, Asia, Europe, uh, the United States, Canada, Australia. Chances are one of my students cooked for you. And I'm super proud of that. And I dedicate this to you. So uh, shout out to a lot of my chef students. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Integra, Yamato, Harvard Business School, Wharton, and Alianza. So, yep. Like I said, this is all about entrepreneurship. And yes, I am a chef. I've been a chef. I've been a chef since 2001, went to school 1999, but uh, I've been in love with entrepreneurship from the first, from the get-go. So let's just get started, shall we? How do I work this Zoomite? I'm pressing something, but it ain't moving. Hui. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the first leg, part one, point one. Um, my first experience with entrepreneurship came in the most uh, unusual of places, which was culinary school. And this culinary school was the California Culinary Academy in San Francisco on the corner of Polk and Turk. And if you've ever been in San Francisco, that's gangsta land. That's a tenderloin. That's near the, um, that's near the city hall. I went to school at, I believe, was the height of the crack epidemic. And I kid you not, when I would walk in the streets, I would see everything. Number one, number two, you know what I'm talking about. I would see people doing it in tents. It was uh, for a Filipino kid who had never lived abroad in his life. It was definitely a culture shock. Thank goodness I was going to culinary school because I was walking with my paring knife in my pocket. Uh, because I did. what happens if I were to get mugged? 
Uh, I would literally zigzag in the streets because there were our African-American gangs. There were the Chinese gangs. There were the Vietnamese gangs. Uh, so I would walk zigzag in the street to avoid them. But anyway, I learned entrepreneurship and CCA for the very first time because that's the first time I saw a profit and loss statement in my life. And if you've never heard of what a profit and loss statement is, a profit and loss or PL is basically goes to show you it's a one of those financial statements that show if you are profitable operations wise for a period. Did you make money in the month of X or did you lose money in the month of X? And something that my teacher, who was a restaurateur, did not teach me, but I caught up on it right away, is that uh, you know, when you look at the PL, there's revenue on top minus the cost of the sales in our essay in, for us chefs it's the food and then you're left with the gross profit which uh, when you calculate that into a percentage it's the margin and whatever margins left after your sales you then pay for these things called the administrative expenses rent salary salaries marketing costs uh, and then of course you're taxed twice you're taxed on the top and then you're taxed on the bottom and then whatever is less is left is for you. That's capitalism for you, ladies and gentlemen. And when I said, Pare, this is this doesn't sound fair. <laughs> well, life isn't fair. But anyway, it doesn't sound fair, but it is how it is. And that's my first brush with entrepreneurship because it ignited in me so many questions. I had to answer it eventually. And now looking back 20 plus years afterwards, it's been a whole life of answering those questions. So living with questions is a, it's a natural thing. And life has a way of uh, addressing them, but not at your time frame, when it's time frame. All right. So when I got back to Manila, um, I was like this fancy kid with a associate degree. I'm a college dropout, mind you. I went to four or five colleges. Let's not even mention them anymore. Well, UST and UP is one, PSID also. Where else did I go? Uh, I was Mr. The I was the one sem wonder. All right. But culinary arts gave me direction. So don't lose hope, kids. Uh, sometimes, you know, the educational system is the one that is flawed. It's not you that's flawed. It's the educational system that's flawed. Uh, we don't all fit in a mold, although some people will want us to. But we don't. So uh, don't mind that. So when I came back to Manila, I was jobless. I had this fancy associate degree. And then uh, I couldn't get the job because they called me overqualified. There was no such thing as a culinary school graduate in 2001. There were very little of us. Uh, the reason why I went to Cali Culinary Academy was because of um, uh, one of the chef idols that I had at the time, who was uh, who is now the, you know, the chef and owner of Brothers Burger here in Manila. Shout out to you, sir. So I was jobless for a good part of coming back. And since I was jobless because I was overqualified, they wouldn't take me in because they said, quote, unquote, the people in the system and the culture would eat you up alive. No one went to school here. It was literally mafia in the kitchen. Uh, if you went in there, they would abuse you. They would use you, make fun of you. You'd stand out like a sore thumb. So it was quite difficult for me. And I had to endure a lot of insults and jests uh, growing up. You know how kids can be, you know, from my friends and family. I had uh, this cousin and uh, she said to me one time in a very pejorative way is, why don't you just cook? Uh, obviously, she was uh, taking a swing at her wonderful college degree and my lack of it. And uh, so eventually I did try to cook. I cooked some... Uh, a frittada from the house. I took my beat up Toyota to Makati and then I tried selling a frittada in packed lunches. My gosh, Chef Rob, did you? I think I, I invented prototype one of the cloud kitchen back in 2001. Anyway, so there was this kid uh, sitting outside of Makati and then I had 30, 24 to 30 food packs. If you imagine walking in the city street and there's this 21-year-old kid selling food from his car with no sign. Oh, my gosh. I'm such an idiot. Such an idiot. 
No one bought my food. I felt so bad when I went home. I was driving home and I was crying my way home. And I feel so bad because I borrowed money from my sister. Thank you. To make to make a fritada and rice. Oh, my gosh. felt so bad. So anyway, that was one of my lowest moments in my life. Uh, basically, I, I was doing so well in school. Finally found something that I love. But then I couldn't sell a frittada in the streets of Makati to save my life at a very low price. People were looking at me like, who's this guy <laughs> peddling food from his car? Anyway, so later on, I eventually worked. Uh, I worked in different places and I, it led me to CCA Manila. No relation to CCA San Francisco, just the same acronym. This stood for Center for Culinary Arts Manila. Uh, shout out to Chef Philip Golding who helped me get there. And that's where I discovered my passion and uh, proclivity for teaching. Um, apparently, I was a good teacher. I was rated 26th of 26 teacher, meaning to say I was the worst of 26 teachers in my first month. But on my sixth month, I became numero uno. Did I get congratulated for it? Hells no. Uh, instead, the people just said, ah, it's just because you're young. Ah, it's just because you, you're like this. They just like you because like this. So they were basically discounting my capabilities in CCA Manila. But to my, to my defense, I was the first teacher to steal the projector. It's this device that projects on the wall. And I was the first one to use PowerPoint in every single lecture. And that led me to becoming the number one teacher. And I worked so hard, I would get linens from the catering department and line, my, uh, line the table when they would present their food so that if they lifted their plate, if it left a mark, then I would see, nah, hey, did they take care to clean their plate? And the students, they loved it. My gosh, we'd polish the spoons. It wasn't silverware, stainless steel, mind you, but we'd polish the spoons, the tasting spoons. I wanted them to feel like it was a hotel. Because I had just graduated and I had just worked in a two-star Michelin hotel. Shout out Mandarin Oriental San Francisco, one of my favorite hotels in the whole world, Mandarin. And uh, Silks. And Salou Garcia, who was a Pinoy f &B director at the time. Shout out, chef. So anyway, uh, that's my stint with CCA. And uh, this really started my entrepreneurial journey. Because the class that I was teaching one time, and you know who you are, we were the first experimental batch for a course at the Asian Institute of Management, or AIM. And what I learned in the AIM is this, and I'm going to share it with you. Uh, their model of entrepreneurship is called VMO, KRA, PI, SPAT REST. In short, we called it VMO Krapi SPAT REST. So if you want to do entrepreneurship, Asian Institute of Management style, this is how they teach it. You can buy the book, Enterprise Creation and Procreation. Um, it's kind of dated, but the principles are still very much valid. And ultimately, it teaches you about the VMOcracy spot rest. To start the business, to be an entrepreneur, you got to have, have a vision. A vision statement is a state of being. A mission statement is how you, what you plan to do in order to achieve that state of being. And then objectives are how you uh, how you get each mission done. Uh, KRA stands for Key Result Areas. PI stands for Performance Indicators. And SPAT REST, S stands for Strategies, uh, Overarching Strategies, which become, which are made of smaller programs, which are made of smaller activities, which are then made of smaller tasks. And REST is the resources. So if you want to have a, if you want to do entrepreneurship AIM style, start with a vision and you work all your way down to the strategies, programs, activities, tasks, and the resources to achieve that. All right. So uh, moving on uh, again, oh, what I learned from these schools in terms of entrepreneurship, part one. Uh, next, uh, when I was in AIM, I was only 23 at the time. And as I was doing pretty well on in my culinary education career, I said, hey, you know what? I can do this. I can offer better prices, 
which is basically a low cost, low cost strategy. Nothing highfalutin there or intelligent, just providing something at a lower cost, which I then realized later on was not right, which I'll explain at a later episode. I should have matched the cost to maximize the margins. But anyway, uh, what's done is done. So ACA was a low cost strategy. I had fun with three friends. We had so much fun in ACA. My gosh, shout out to all my ACA students out there. Uh, I enjoyed going to work. I enjoyed cooking. Wow, we had so much fun. Our school, I believe, was like 160. Dude, sorry, but we were under TESDA spec. TESDA is a crediting body. We were under 160 square meters. But boy, oh boy, were we creating some waves then. Um, so ultimately, we were three friends. Uh, there was a falling out of the three friends. And uh, I founded Global and invited my one of my friends to join me. And then uh, Global was yet another low-cost provider. So we just, I just kept on going low-cost. Uh, until now, these schools are still open. It's good to be low-cost. However, like I said, in retrospect, I shouldn't have done low-cost. Uh, because the value of culinary education is just too good to play the cost game. Because when you play the cost game, eventually no one wins. Because as you lower your costs, you create a price war and the margins decrease for the market. It's not good for anyone. If your margins decrease, you can give less value to your students. It doesn't work. So now I am totally, I never go low cost player anymore in anything. I don't want to be. It's either the best to the middle, but never low cost. All right. So eventually, um, I was with this company for 10 years. I sold uh, eventually for because of some uh, unsavory events, which I'm not even going to get into. But what I learned here was to keep friends and family separate, if I would say. Uh, in both cases, AK and Global, friends and family got involved to a, to a degree that was no longer inappropriate for business growth. And when that happens, especially for Filipinos, who are very sensitive people, mind you, um, we uh, it just didn't work. It created too much tension and friction and strife. So eventually something had to give. And so it did. So eventually it sold global to the other group and uh, moved on. And as I moved on, I had to figure out what am I going to do with my life? Because since I sold global to the other group, I couldn't open a culinary school for three years. You got that right, three years. And so what I did was, hey, you know what? My other passion was entrepreneurship. And since I have this other passion of entrepreneurship, why don't I teach with Integra Business School? So we opened Integra in Ortigas in 2016. Eventually, our business courses were the ones that were selling. Everything else wasn't. So we listened to the market. And we transformed Integra Institute of Art, Business, and Tech into Integra Business School. But our, we knew we couldn't be an Asian Institute of Management. So many people made fun of me again. Shout out to all you college degree holders and MBA degree holders. Huh? He's like, what in the world is that guy doing with a business school? I mean, they didn't know I was into entrepreneurship for the longest time. It reminded me of my cousin. She said, why don't you just cook? That's what she said. So, so uh, why don't you just cook in a very pejorative way? And in a way that the college degree people and the MBA degree people, my gosh, they were making fun of me. My friends were telling me what people were saying in this school and that school. Uh, so I felt so bad. Here I was. You know, I worked so hard in my dream. Uh I experienced the dirty side of what lawyers play when there's like a share purchase agreement to be made. My gosh, it was like watching an episode of Suits. Uh, it was like a ten. I it's like I got my MBA from the street smart school of hard knocks. I was so stressed out, I couldn't sleep. Uh, but ultimately, I learned a lot. So there was Integra Business School, and to supplement my teaching with Integra Business School. Eventually, I went and took some, I spent some serious bank. Since I had just sold the company, I had uh, quite, a, quite a bit of cash. Uh, I spent some serious bank 
on my education. So I took six courses from Harvard Business School uh, and two courses from Wharton and Wharton School, uh, University of Pennsylvania. And then I also took a very expensive ramen course from which originated from Tokyo. No? And uh, so let's talk about what I learned. Well, ultimately, when we opened Integra and it forced itself into becoming a business school, I said, I'm going to have to study business now because, you know, too many people are making fun of me. So I have to study business now. And the first course I ever took was Disruptive Strategy by Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School. So it was pretty good. And then later on, I took a core Credentials of Readiness, which included economics for managers, uh, financial accounting, and business analytics. And so as I took that course, uh, it was also pretty cool. I took it through their HBX online platform. Uh, and then later on, I took up management principles, leadership principles. Oh, seven courses pala. And then last but definitely not the least, was entrepreneurship. So let's talk about the Harvard Business School style of entrepreneurship really quick. And that is the POCD by William Shaman. He's not a shaman. It's spelled Salman. Here it is in the slides. So POCD stands for people. Uh, these are the people involved. O stands for the opportunity. What is the opportunity involved? And C stands for the context. And then finally, it's the deal. So when it comes to the POCD framework, uh, I, I, it was difficult to understand in the beginning, first time I heard it. But as I continued in my road and of entrepreneurship, it made so much more sense and it's very accurate. It's a proven framework. It works. It basically, um, it basically chops up entrepreneurship into the different major areas. There's the people area, the founders, the investors, the shareholders, the partners, uh, the dynamics of that. Then there's the opportunity area. Is the opportunity a lower culinary school? Is the opportunity AI? Is the opportunity all about cloud kitchens? What is it? Then there's the context of things. You know, The context um, is basically the factors, specific nuances and factors that surround each case. And last but not the least, it's the deal. What's your deal with your suppliers? What's your deal with your investors? Why would they invest in you when 80% of startups fail? Uh, yada, 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 yada. So that's the Harvard Business School POCD framework. It's pretty cool. You can Google it. It's pretty cool. Um, if I compare that to the AIM VM Okra piece, Pat Ress, um, I don't think it's meant to be compared. I think what they do is help you see it from different points of view, but but then the framework just gives you a way of how you can tackle it. So I tackle it, I use both, POCD and VMocracy Spatres. All right, so moving on, after my seven courses in Harvard Business School, I took two courses in Wharton, also online. Uh, I didn't want to spend the, the amount of money to go abroad, which uh, which I regret because of COVID. You know, because of COVID, we were stuck indoors for two years. And if I had gone gone abroad, took the short course in the Harvard or the Wharton campus, I think I would have had so much fun. But anyway, I didn't. Uh, so what I what I learned from Harvard, from Wharton Aman was, sorry to say this, no, how unintelligent I am. I'm, I'm not, this is not a pity party. It's like, the Harvard the, the Harvard Business School was good because they, they, they explained things in a very visual sense so you could understand it. But when I went to Wharton, they were very quantitative people. They were quants. And uh, everything was a formula, which I couldn't understand half the symbols on the board. Formula? You had they had a formula for digital marketing. Like, what the heck? It's such a it's a it's how do you put that in a formula? So anyway, that's just how they were. I appreciated it. But this guy, William Bell, is that his name? I didn't put it here. He developed this thing called gravity, which I really resonated well with. So the framework of gravity starts with geography. You know, entrepreneurship and marketing, it's all about geography. 
like how close or how far the people from your product uh, resistance or stickiness. What is their resistance from buying your product and how can you break it? Uh, adjacency means uh, pretty much if you take a look at yourself and your competition, what are the different substitutes? How do they interact with the target market? Why do they work? Can you use it to actually cut the resistance and make it sticky for the for your target uh, target market? Uh, next up is vicinity, which I completely don't remember about it. Um, so let's not even go there. Uh, next is uh, isolation and focus. Um, they had an interesting, a very interesting exercise here. Uh, they asked students, there were the, okay, they asked students to count how many times a ball was passed by the white team. There were two teams in this video, people in white shirts and people in black shirts. You can YouTube this, it's still there somewhere. So the people in the black shirts are passing a ball, same colored ball. The people in the white shirts were passing a same colored ball. There were about four to five people each group. 10 people on the street, and they played it for one minute. The job of the students was to count how many times the white team, the one in the white shirts, passed the ball. So when they played it for 60 seconds, you're there busy counting, 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 taking a look at the white team passing the ball. Uh, unbeknownst to everybody, there is a gorilla in a black suit, a gorilla in a gorilla suit, like the black t-shirts, who walked by started waving, and then walked out of the frame. And of course, they didn't tell you this. But at the end of it, everyone had this amazing answer. We thought we were so smart. I thought I was special. I don't remember the number, but I said 128, for example. 128. The white team passed the ball 128 times. And then so the teacher goes, okay, fine. But did you see the gorilla in the video? And everyone's like, wait. What? what 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 gorilla is there? I don't, I don't understand what you mean by the gorilla. So that they played it back and show the gorilla there. So ultimately, what the lesson was, uh, we tend to we tend to be biased to what we focus on. Uh, that's very profound. That way, that can be a parenting vlog later on. But we tend to be biased to what we focus on, and I, I believe that was the big lesson in the isolation. And then, last but not the least, is topography or how the space is, the space or the arena in which you you are a part of, you want to be a part of as an entrepreneur, how it's laid out, you know, who are the players, who's got the biggest, uh, the biggest scale, who's got this technology, who's got that, and how will you position yourself? Is the market growing? Is the market contracting? Obviously, you want to have a growing market. So these are all the things I learned from California Culinary Academy to Wharton. Uh, and then eventually, when it came to teaching entrepreneurship to my students, I said, you know what? So much of this is too highfalutin when my average student hasn't even ever seen a profit and loss statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement altogether. Um, and I believe that's my market. I, I, like, I don't pretend to be teaching college graduates or MBA students. You guys, you already think you're so smart. You can just have your cake. Go eat it too. Uh, guess what? For every one of you, there's ten thousand others out there who are better. So don't be such a don't be such a douche about it, and get some humility and empathy. Probably you could. That would be the biggest lesson that you guys could have. But ultimately, my market is the beginners. I call them the grassroots. Uh, what I realized over time is they're completely underserved. No one wants to teach a celebrity who never went to college the importance of cash flow and PL. No one wants to teach um, willingness to pay. No one wants to teach uh, the difference of the problem with the price bar. No one wants to teach them that because, in the eyes of traditional education, uh, these are the quote unquote not intelligent like us people. But those are the people that I serve. And these are the people that I, I love. Uh, I love you guys. You're like me. People make fun of us because we don't have college degrees. Fuck them. Fuck them. Seriously. Uh, screw them.
Uh, that's what this channel is for. So the Integra 4M model is something that's very cool. I like it because it's simple. The first, these are the four M's of entrepreneurship or the different forces that come together. And the first M is the mindsets, the mindsets of the people. Right? So if you want to get into business, you want to start a business that's entrepreneurship, uh, how's your mindset like? What's your experience? What's your knowledge? Uh, what's the mindset of you and your partner? Right? What's the mindset of you and your partners? That's very critical because if you can see problems such as overlapping of roles and responsibilities, um, you have to be clear about how you would separate those roles so that you can have a good working relationship. There's a joke in Integra Business School that 9.5 out of 10 partnerships fail. And we're talking about partnerships where you're kind of really working together. Uh, and if you notice, there's no such thing as 9.5 partners, right? It's just, it's actually 10 out of 10 based on our experience in class. In every class, everyone who's ever had a partner before, eventually they have a falling out. Scary numbers, man. Scary numbers. And it may not always be the case. You might be the lucky one. That's why there's still the 0.5. But eventually there's either a falling out or a separation. And uh, it's sad but true. But knowing this, you can protect the vision, protect yourself, and protect your relationship with your loved ones. So, uh, okay, so the first one is the mindsets. The second one in Integra, the 4M, is the market. And the market, it's all about the target market, the competition, the price that's already out there, the demand. And if there is a market at all to begin with, so that's the second M, how it interacts with you, um, who are the players in this market, and how you plan to do business in this market, which leads to the next M, which is the third M of my 4M model, which I share with in Integra, which is the model. Basically, how do you model your product? How do you model your team? How you design your business model? What's your strategy? What's your plan? And last but not the least is everything that has to do with money, because everything that has to do with money involves your investors, your shareholders, the city hall, the SEC. Uh, it involves all of these different players. And um, you need to have a system in place which addresses them so that you're compliant. All right. Um, all right. So next up also now, I, uh, I have to talk about Alianza, which is uh, an entrepreneurship in real life, the school of hard knocks. So, so Alianza is a culinary school I teach in now. It's a school that I founded. It's culinary arts. We are a culinary school with a restaurant. Integra Business School opened in 2016. And this year, we're bringing it back to life. No more COVID. No more COVID mindset. And so I'm excited for that. And in a way, this entrepreneurship video, this entrepreneurship video is all about uh, reigniting the Saturday entrepreneurial spirit that we have had with Integra Business School. So all Integra alumni, this video is for you also. Uh, but I want to talk about another school I went to. Uh, it's a master class in ramen, which I had so much fun. Uh, Chef Jason's there on top. And Chef Fujisan is the founder of Yamato Noodle. He is so relevant to all your lives, you have no idea. If you love ramen or you eat in marugame udon, or you love udon, his machines make the noodles. He's the founder of Yamato Noodle. Uh, he's one of the founders of Yamato Noodle. And what I learned from him is that when you apply science and technicality, something so trivial like making noodles can really scale. And when something can scale, that's when entrepreneurship can flourish. So he's like the noodle king of Asia. Um, they make a science out of making ramen. They make the machines that make the noodles that make ramen, udon, and so on and so forth. So that's part 1.4. All right, so we're going to end this episode really quick. I want to give a shout out to all my students everywhere. Um, I'm going to repeat this message again and again. It's the first time I'm doing it. I know it's long. I'll probably cut it up into pieces, but basically it's also a gift to my father. Jan 14 is his birthday. Happy birthday, dad. 
uh, I know you're up there. Uh, so happy birthday. He was also an entrepreneur in his own right. And shout out to any one of you who's having a difficult time now with entrepreneurship. Just know that difficulties cannot last. Uh, it's only a season. It's often in difficulties. Our weaknesses come out. And when the weaknesses come out, if you want to look at it from a positive point of view, you now know which parts of you can strengthen. Because once you strengthen that, then your breakthrough should come and you'll be able to overcome your challenges. In life. So anyway, that's it for this episode, long-winded episode. Ha, huh, that was tough. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. Is there anything about entrepreneurship or anything else that you'd like me to share with you? I'd be happy to. Ciao for now, mga sabaw. Peace out.